So in terms of the structural provisions, a new part's been incorporated, part 3.0, and this brings together a few of the different structural provisions parts to the code. They were previously in part 3.10, 3.11 of the code. It was spread throughout various other parts of the code. And this part's essentially a roadmap. And it will send you to say, for timber framing, go to part 3.4.3, and it will have those provisions in there. It also has your wind classification areas in here, has your importance level for buildings. So it's a imp very important part that sometimes is often over overlooked rather than actually being focused on. And we thought it was really important as part of this work on reviewing the volume two, and I'll say we today in terms of that, because of that project they're talking about in terms of reviewing the code involved us and the number of other industry associations and the ABCB and some of the regulators. Um, to get this stuff and make it clear up front about what the structural provisions are. So two new parts have also been incorporated, part 3.11 and 3.12. 3.11 deals with earthworks and 3.12 now deals with a new part specifically for earth retaining structures or retaining walls. The 3.11 provisions really you're still going to be getting a geotechnical engineer um, to do your designs in the most part for or a structural engineer getting a geotech report and designing your your footing systems for your building and any site cuts or fill that you do because these provisions are quite limiting you know they only apply where you've got a structure that's three meters from the boundary and i don't know how many of you are building in in canberra three meters from the boundary in, in many of your projects so they're more for isolated cuts but what it does also have is for where you're taking ex excavations adjacent to your footings and other things like that. There's also been some provision, but it also gives you some of your, um, your angle of repose requirements for your different soil types about um, your different gradient type of flow um, cuts, which are already in the code, but now a, a bit clearer than what they were. There's also been a new part, as I mentioned, for earth retaining structures. This has really been an area of the code that's been silent for a, for a number of years. You could always use your 1170 standards, you know, your first, in, first principles engineering standards, or your 1720 for timber structures, 3600 for concrete structures. But a new part has been incorporated that applies in conjunction with those parts. Those can still be used, those design standards, and it incorporates a new standard, which is AS4678, which talks about earth retaining structures. It is a first principles engineering standard, um, and so it's not going to be your deemed to satisfy type of standard like a 1684 which gives you span tables and things like that but it gives you your engineer a potential option of what they might use as part of their design of retaining walls. For 2022 we'll likely see actual prescriptive retaining wall provisions developed for inclusion in the code as well um, and that's work that's undertaken. There's a number of industry publications on various retaining wall designs and they're being worked up at the moment. I should clarify though that the application of this standard will differ. It's intended to be a standard that applies to retaining walls that form part of the structure of the building, um, not for garden type retaining walls. Um, I'm not sure exactly, and someone probably can clarify for me in the room, but I think over one metre in the ACT, you have to have the retaining wall designed by an engineer. Is that correct? Or is it 1.2? It does change around the country. Anyone? Is it one metre? One metre, yeah. Generally, it's around the one metre. Some parts, I think, in New South Wales, I think it might be down at 600 mil. It's quite low. Yep. So, but it does form part, essentially those retaining walls that form, that require building approval, not those ones that are like garden type retaining walls, but it does differ you know, state to state with this one. Um, that doesn't, by incorporating these standards into the code in this new part, it doesn't change that requirement. You'll still need to have the, that's a concurrent requirement where the engineer needs to be involved in the design, but this gives them that, an, one of the a different design option in terms of design standard that they can use. And part of the explanatory information has been incorporated into the code to explain exactly what I've just said there about this is one of a range of options, what's the intended scope of application of the standard, but there are re other regulatory requirements that might apply in addition to this. So talking about the changes to the, um, and I mentioned before about the reintroduction into of the masonry, some masonry provisions back into the code. So, up till 2011 BCA, it contained provisions for masonry veneer, double brick, single skin construction. 
With the publication of a new standard AS4773 parts one and part two, which is masonry for small buildings, this standard was put into the code and a decision was made to remove that content from the provisions, the acceptable construction practice provisions in the code and just rely on the standard. This is probably where it really became the pressure point time and really when HIA and others really said enough's enough to the, AB, to the ABCB about this. So in terms of that, as I mentioned, the ABCB listened to that criticism and have this project. And for 20, 2019 code, we now have new provisions reincorporated into the code for masonry veneer construction and for isolated and engaged um, peers. You can still use the standard, the standard is still referenced there, and this just gives another deemed to satisfy compliance option. It isn't a complete reincorporation of the old ACP that used to be in the code for masonry construction. It's been updated based on some, move, some changes in technology and things like that, and, chain, and stuff taking account of what's out of 4773. But it captures all your current, you know, all your things that you expect it to cover in terms of mortar mixes and bedding joints, your cavity widths, location installation of damp proof course requirements, your weep hole spacings, your wall tie spacings, your lintel requirements, and your location installation, articulation joints, all of that type of stuff. So really, really useful type of things that when you're on site and you go, oh, where does that damp proof course need to be? You know, does it, what height does it need to be at again? What's my bearing requirements for my lintel either side of the opening? I can't quite remember. Be able to quickly open up the code and find it. You know, what are my wall tie spacings and what, what are my wall type materials I need to use? That was spread over three different standards. Really complicated way of getting to the answer. It doesn't need to be that, it doesn't need to be that tough, does it? You know, having it there in the one place makes it so much simpler to use and apply. And particularly for when you're on site and you just want to know that answer quite quickly and just trying to be a, a jog in your memory, you know, that's in there. There are some limitations on its application. Um, it only, this, for this masonry veneer provisions, it only apply to AS and M sites. You know, I think majority of Canberra's class M sites in the most part. It only applies up to buildings with a wind speed of no greater than N3, which I think most in Canberra would be less than N3 or thereabouts or N3. So, and there is some, some building geometry limitations such as 8.5 metres to the underside of the E, 16 metres wide, five times the length and those types of things. But that's applicable, as you would say, for most of the standards anyway. Here's just a couple of figures that have been um, incorporated. Um, and as I mentioned, here's, everyone would know these figures quite well. I think they were, when I did my cert for many, many, many years ago, these figures were in those late training material and, I, and they're very useful ones to have, you know, available to you. And also about, you know, your, your lintels and your, your and things like that. Another part, as I mentioned, has also been incorporated for isolated um, masonry piers. And this incorporates requirements for piers supporting roofs, such as veranda roofs and patios, piers for freestanding carports, and subfloor piers, including raised floors up to three metres off the ground. There's also some provisions for engaged piers as well. This is probably really good to bring these into the code because they were mixed over AS4773 parts one and part two. To have it in the code itself, again, just makes it simpler and easy to use. Okay, I'll keep going through and, I'll, I might, um, and then open up for questions in a little bit. Um, another one of the changes into the subfloor provisions, and this is one of those ones that is one of those innocuous ones you wouldn't really notice unless you're, you're looking at it. And a change has been made for where you have in-ground timber to use durability class one or two timbers or H5 pre preservative treated timbers. It's, there is some application around this to put into the context. This applies where ground or subfloor space is excessively damp or subject to frequent flooding, or where just say you can't achieve your, your clearance requirements from the underside of your bearer to your, to your subfloor. And this is one of the options you could use. You could also use an impervious ground membrane. Um, you could use a steel in accordance uh, with the NASH standard or use the durability class timbers. This is one of those ones I thought worth highlighting because you wouldn't just notice it in terms of going through all the different code changes because it's only one of those subtle changes but don't want you to get caught out on it. The timber framing section has also had some changes. It hasn't resulted in timber framing ACP provisions being incorporated back into the code. I don't think it ever will again. 
you know, this is probably one of those areas that is would be extremely difficult to reincorporate or put something like 1684 and all of its content into the code itself. How do you rewrite the span tables that are different from 1684? You really can't. I think 1684 is one of those ones that we're always going to be with, and I think it feeds into Trent's big other point he mentioned earlier about that access to standards sort of issue. We used to, it did have it in the first, in the early editions of the code about the timber framing provisions, but a lot of them were quite limiting in application, um, and hence 1684 was the predominant document used. New Zealand, for instance, have gone down a pathway of trying to develop up all of these provisions and had this in the housing code. They're about to withdraw that code because no one's using it because it's such limiting factors and really the standard is really the, the one for this one. So as much as it's um, always going to be a frustration for this one that it will be in a standard, I think we can't avoid this one. It's one of those ones that it is quite a well-written standard. There is some, it can be better, but it is one that we're always going to be have to use. Some of the changes that have been made is to bring some of the different timber standards and put them into this one part. Previously, it was spread over five or six different parts to the code in terms of 1720, which is the timber structures code, the 1720 part five, which is your design of, of nail plated timber trusses. Um, so, and then there was also others that were secondary reference documents that were really primary standards, but were only called up through secondary standards such as the installation of particle board flooring. So making that clear in the code about it does, you know, this is really a deemed to satisfy document. Where they are at secondary standards and it's not clear whether they do apply or don't, it lives in that grey space and that's not good for anyone. You know, to know whether you should or shouldn't, whether you do or, or don't have to comply with it. And also secondary standards don't generally get the level of scrutiny that a primary standard when it goes into the code in terms of impact analysis of what the changes might mean, a standards committee might just say, well, that sounds like a good idea, so we'll change that requirement. By having it as a primary standard in the code, it can control some of that. In saying that, I don't want 3,000 secondary and tertiary standards written into the code at all. But for some of these ones that we know we need to comply with, to have them as a primary standard, we can put that scrutiny on them going forward and make it really clear that they do apply I think that is, that is a good outcome for some of these ones. So that's what some of the changes to the timber framing section has been. So moving into part 3.5, and part 3.5 has been had a significant overhaul. Part 3.5 deals with um, roof cladding, gutters and downpipes and wall cladding. The new part has been split to make it much more logical and has a lot of updates and enhancements to it. 3.5.1 now deals with sheet roofing, both metal and plastic. 3.5.2 deals with roof tiles and shingles. 3.5.3 deals with gutters and downpipes. 3.5.4 deals with timber wall cladding. Sorry, not timber, just wall cladding. And 3.5.5 deals with metal wall cladding. Some of this, you know, in terms of the sheet roofing requirements in 3.5.1, that was previously, there was one clause that was spread over 16 pages of the code. 16 pages for one clause. And it mixed and matched, it went dealt into corrosion protection requirements in one part, spans, fixing requirements. It was really, didn't have any logical flow whatsoever. So the part's been revised and now, as I mentioned, deals with sheet roofing, metal and plastic. Um, it has acceptable construction practice provisions for metal roofing. For plastic roofing, it would just, it only has the standard reference there. The standard for, um, for metal sheet roofing, AS 1562 part one has also been updated qu um, quite a bit and I'll touch on that later about the standards component. Um, there's been updated provisions for the fixing requirements and span requirements. The part deals with both face fixing and concealed fasten roofing. Um, there's been updated flashing requirements as well, flashing provisions. Um, there's been a lot of, um, you know, where people have raised issues of interpretation um, over the years, there's been some prov provisions updated to clarify some of that, particularly about the compatibility requirements between fixings and fastenings and the flashings and the roofing and things like that. Um, and also about um, what is the minimum gutter overhang of the roof into the gutter. 
Um, and also, but and been and this is a common theme throughout Volume Two. A lot of new, new, a lot more figures have been incorporated into the code. A lot more explanatory information, and a lot of, and there's been some updates and revisions around some of the flashing requirements. Some of the flashing and the capping requirements really fell into that area of written in 1996 and really haven't kept pace with the current, with um, with the current code, with the current practices. Similarly with the 352, the roof tiles and shingles part of the code, this was previously all muddled together with the, the, the metal sheet roofing provisions and now that it's in its own separate part. As part of this, it now captures a new um, roof slates and shingles standard. The one that was previously referenced in the code was an American standard that hadn't been published for the last 10 years. So I don't know if anyone was ever been able to get access to that standard for the last 10 years and whether anyone's actually even used it. It was very specific to, to it. A new standard has now been incorporated into the code for roof slates and shingles, which is an Australian standard and is part of the AS2050 suite of standards. AS2050, which is the installation of roof tile standards, has also been updated. Um, there's been another quite a bit of change to this part about your fixing requirements for your for your field of roof rather than your edges of your roofing. What are the requirements for me mechanical fastening of roofing, of, of roof tiles, particularly cut roof tiles? So after the, um, the cyclones up in North Queensland, I think in 2012, there was a substantial number of amendments to the standards because a lot of those standards flew off and become flying debris and peeled back and there was a lot of water ingress into those buildings. So there was a lot of work was done about that. And so a lot of some of those changes have been incorporated into the building code itself now rather than just in the standard. Another area was really grey was about how about flashing and flashing of roof tiles. AS2050 doesn't contain any requirements about it. It calls up AS3500 Part 3, which is your plumbing standard, which has some very gen generic type of roof provisions. So there's been updates now and actually provisions and figures incorporated into, into BCA or NCC um, in terms of flashings for penetrations through the roof where it might be the tiles are butting a wall like in the picture in the diagram here and then you know around the chimney flashing requirements so you'll see a lot more figures there in terms of the flashing requirements and also a number of other um, figures and explanatory information as well incorporated into the code. Also the sarking requirements um, have been clarified, the pitch requirements as well so your sarking requirements, we have a low pitch roof. Um, there's always a bit of a grey area about when sarking needs to be installed under tiled roofs there. And also about, that type, about the sarking requirements where your rafters or your trusses are over a certain length about where you need to have the sarking in those circumstances as well. So in terms of the wall cladding provisions, there's been quite a substantial update of those provisions and this is probably one of those ones that Trent mentioned where there's probably been band-aids upon band-aids of changes to these parts where it hadn't really been a substantial review of this part for quite a while. So some of the changes include a revised approach to the fixing requirements and talking about an embedment depth into the, into the start or the supporting structure rather than saying it needs to be a 65 mil twisted shank nail, galvanised nail of this type and this width, width in diameter, it now talks about the embedment depth of the nail, which is a much more um, practical way of doing it and also reflects a lot of it, how it's done in some number of international standards. There's also been the incorporation of provisions for battened out cavities. It doesn't make it mandatory to have battened out cavities with rather than having direct fixed cladding to have where you might have a battened out cavity create um, for it. A lot of people are starting to do this more and more where the code was silent on it. So now it gives some deem to satisfy around it. I know there's a lot of tested systems that are out there in the system and Tim might mention it in part of his presentation with James Hardy about some of those systems, about the battened out cavities. A number of years ago, you might remember, sorry, that um, the building codes board incorporated a verification method into the code for weatherproofing, which was predominantly for class two to nine buildings. And that included direct fix, a battened out cavity, a drained, bank, drained and battened out cavity, and for a unique wall system. So with more people moving to this types of construction 
um, it's incorporated those requirements into the code. With the condensation provisions into the code as well, there's a lot of moves to probably look at battened out cavities rather than direct fix going forward. And this is an area, so we thought it was worthwhile incorporating some deemed to satisfy in it. There's much more prescriptive uh, requirements for window flashing being incorporated, and I will talk about those changes. Um, there's new provisions included for wall cladding provisions for parapet walls. The code was silent on parapet walls. I know we've all been building parapet walls for the best part of, what, 15 years, and the code's just been silent on parapet walls, and, and also includes some requirements for sarking where that parapet is abutting a roof. Um, and there's also some, some capping requirements for those parapet walls. There's some new provisions incorporated for the minimum clearance requirements between the cladding and the ground. And that also take, you know, which aligns a lot with the provisions for damp and weatherproofing in the code, but you also might have concurrent requirements for termite management provisions in the code for your clearance requirements where you use that as your termite management system. There's been some inclusion of the revised, and I hate saying this, autoclaved aerated concrete standard. Hopefully I can say AAC for the rest of the day, if that's all right. And that incorporates, um, in, in, in general, that Previously, the, the code um, through the standards referenced only allowed AAC panels that were 75 mil, where now that standard's been updated and allows for, for panels less than 75 mil, so you could use 50 mil panels. I think it's 50 mil still the limit on that one, which is a lot of panels being used. I know, know how much in ACT you're using the 50 mil panels. I know that some of the systems had code mark certificates, but in, in South Australia in particular, they've been using 50 mil AAC panels for quite a few years now. Um, there's been a number of new figures and enhanced explanatory information throughout the whole thing, and also about the fixing of the sarking requirements rather than just reference the standard that actually has the fixing requirements in there. And there's also a new part for metal wall cladding provisions into the code. We're probably likely to see um, prescriptive ACP provisions for metal wall cladding in future editions of the code to, um, that will there be there in conjunction with the, um, the reference, the, the standard AS1562 part one. So one of the changes I wanted to highlight to you, and I'm not sure how well you can see that up the back, um, but one of the changes for the flashing requirements for windows, it's, it now clarifies quite clearly that a window needs to be flashed all the way round the window and that that flashing needs to be a minimum of 110 mil all the way around. Previously, the code said that the window, all openings needed to be flashed, but didn't go into any further detail than that. So this is now, makes it very prescriptive and very clear that the whole way around a window needs to be flashed and it needs to be a minimum of 110 mil and be a material complying with AS, NZS 2904. So that might be your damp proof course sort of you know, your DPC that you currently have that comes with your windows or you use for your damp proof course, that material is a material complies with 2904. It does also acknowledge that 110 mil isn't always going to be practicable. When you've got two windows in close proximity to each other, you're never going to achieve that 110, you know. If you've got a window, it's a corner junction, you're not going to achieve it. So it talks about where practicable. Um, I'm not sure in ACT, I, I, pretty, I think I know the answer to this, but do your windows currently come with side and head flashings or only come with sill flashing? It's just sills. So in Queensland and some other parts of the country, um, they do currently come with flashings all the way around the window. Something you might want to be talking about with your window manufacturers is to request that they provide you with that flashing all the way around the window going forward. It certainly makes your job easier if it's already attached to the frame, um, but that is something that we probably have been suggesting around the place that you might want to start that conversation going. It also requires that the flushing, um, particularly the head and the sill flushing, that, that it goes to the outside, that it fl is flushed to the outside. Um, so another thing there to, to take note of. And it does have some fixing requirements there. This is probably going to be one of those ones that we really wanted to highlight. We don't want you to get caught out with it. You know, some are doing it, not all are doing it. It's one of those ones that I know people a lot of the time will do head flushing or you might use your sarking and use your tape that, you know, goes around the window. This is now very prescriptive in its system. Tim will probably talk about from a Hardy's perspective that there is a number of tested systems that don't use the deemed to satisfy prescriptive provisions that take into account 
the system, the cladding, how it all goes together as part of a tested system. Um, but you need to follow all of those components of that tested system rather than trying to vary out specific components of it. Also, provision of this here talks about that the window and the flashing needs to be, you know, taking account of the window system that you're using, the framing system you're using, and the reveals that you're using. Because as many of us will know, that it's as much about the framing and the window reveal as it is about you know, how you conceal it. So this is one of those ones that really put a note next to and go back and do a bit more scrutiny when you're back in your office so, so you don't get caught out with it.